Hello guys, welcome back to another video, and today I'm going to be covering the September 2024 patch, which includes both a balance patch and a uh, reserve card rework, so they're bringing back several cards out of reserve into the game, so these are sort of new-ish cards entering the game, and they've been heavily reworked from their original version, so they're essentially new cards at the cost of old cards out of reserves. Um, so yeah, that's what we're going to be talking about today, talking about the impact it has on the decks that are being played now, and what possible decks might be able to be played or might be stronger uh, moving forward. So, let's roll the intro and jump straight into it. What a performance there by J-King. J-King, full plot armor. J-King is pushing himself into the ranks of the legend. J-King is our world champion! J-King 7! What? The back-to-back -back cards world champion! Alrighty, so normally I like to start with the balance patch, um, just because the balance patch is typically more impactful. Um, but in this case, I actually think the reserve card reworks are might be more impactful. Um, so we're going to start with that. And for these cards, they didn't actually include a picture of the old version. For the most part, this doesn't matter, because most of these cards are cards that you probably never saw before and definitely saw zero competitive play. And I don't think anyone's really going to miss when... Um, now that they're gone, and if if relevant, I will mention what the old version is. But as it says here, there's 18 total cards being returned, three for each major nation, and then one for France, Italy, and Poland, because there are no Finnish cards in reserve. And they're sorted by nation. So, first up, Britain is getting Tactical Withdrawal, which is a one-credit order, retreat a friendly unit in the front line, and fully repair it, and it can operate again this turn. So, I see there is sort of two different paths you can use for this, um, because obviously it's meant to be just sort of a general tech card, it, it's a bit of a utility card, but it, these types of cards are just really, really bad in cards, and Britain is a particularly bad nation for this type of effect, because Britain has basically zero deck that likes to take the front line with anything. Um, so yeah, it's it's intended to be a tech card, and you know maybe you can try to build something around that. But I see there's two possible ways that this sees any relevant play, and that is one as a combo card. So particularly looking at the second sentence on tactical withdrawal here, uh, can operate again this turn. Basically, I think my thought and the thought I'm sure a lot of players have had is you get a Hummer uh, or pa possibly a Valentine, one of these. Fury tanks, you get it to the front line, you buff its attack, you attack twice, and then you tactical withdrawal, so it can operate again for free, and, well, not for free, but it can operate again, which means it can attack twice again, um, and so you basically get to attack four times um, on the same turn if you can have a buffed up Hummer, uh, and ideally you would want its operation cost reduced. Um, just because that is a lot of moves and attacks, and you also need to figure out a way to give it blitz. So, it's it, it's not easy. I don't really see a clear combo that's remotely better than push, um, but maybe in the future. And then the other possibility for this card is specifically with effects that trigger when entering the front line, and the most notable effect that I can think of would be the Panther A in some form of Britain-German draw denial or German-Britain draw denial, where you push up the Panther A, which says when this enters the front line, the opponent does not draw a card on the following turn, so you push that up, they don't draw a card, and then on the following turn, you tactical withdraw it back to your support line and then push it up again so they don't draw a second turn in a row. Um, now, that does seem pretty complicated because, you know, Panther A does not have Blitz, so you have to play it, and then they have an opportunity to kill it, and then if they can't, you can push it up, and then they don't draw a card, and then you probably win the game if they still can't kill it. Like, if you play Panther A, they can't kill it, and then you push it to the front line, and it's still can they still can't kill it across two turns, you probably won the game and don't want to be running a card that just is super win more, but again, maybe that is possible in the future, but otherwise pretty whatever card. And this used to be, like, one of the single worst cards in the game, so, you know, the fact that it's maybe possible to play around with now is interesting. Then they get the Cromwell Mark IV. So this is a four-cost, two-operation uh, special tank, 3-5, and it has a guard and heavy armor 1. So already pretty good. Four-cost for a 3-5 guard is on the weaker side, um, but heavy armor 1 immediately makes this just like a pretty solid body. And then it has the additional text, when, the enemy, when an enemy unit is pinned, also suppress it. And... At the moment, this is not 
an amazing effect. Um, I would say because right now the really the only um, British control decks that are seeing any significant play would be Britain US, and US has access to the B24J, which, you know, is AoE Suppress, so Britain doesn't really lack for Suppress, and also right now there's not many great ways to pin in Britain. Um, but keep an eye out on this, because if Monty ever returns, and I think there's a reasonable chance Monty will return at some point, um, this is going to be absolutely cracked as a combo, because Monty will become not only a one-credit, pin all enemy units, draw a card, it will be one-credit, pin all enemy units, suppress all enemy units, draw a card. And that's going to be absolutely broken, but I suspect if they do bring back Monty, will probably be in a reworked way. Um, so currently, it's an interesting card. Uh, I think people might try it out, just because the body alone is good enough that... You're not making your deck substantially worse if you are playing some sort of unit-based British control deck, and you want to throw in a couple pin cards and try to get this guy to work. Um, then the last British card that's been brought back is the Royal West Kents, and this is a very interesting card. Um, so it's a... the old version of this card sucked. The old version of Cromwell was fine, but way too uh, situational. Royal West Kents used to suck. And what it is now is actually very, very interesting. So it's a 4 credit, 1 operation cost, infantry, limited, 4-4 four, four Blitz Guard. And this might be one of the only Blitz Guard units in the game. Um, I'm just thinking off the top of my head. I'm sure somebody will correct me about that. But it has the effect, your other Guard units have plus 2 attack and Blitz. So... This is an ability Britain now has to give units Blitz, and if Britain can give units Guard, it can functionally give units Guard and Blitz, and an attack buff with Royal West Kent. Now, the only way that Britain has to give units Guard at the moment is with Strong Bond, and that's four credits, so that's way too expensive to get into the combo range. But if they ever bring back Naval... Or if they ever bring back Supply Drop, which is a two-credit order, give a unit plus four, eight, or plus four defense and a Guard... Um, that can combo really well with Royal West Kents, and of course, it can just work well by itself, because if you're playing a very guard-heavy, slow control deck, um, Royal West Kents will allow you to be much more reactive, um, rather than just simply playing down guard units and your opponent controls the trades, Royal West Kents can buff the attack of your guard units, um, and if you're running, say, Soviet Ally for cards like the 1-8 guard, um, going from a 1-8 guard to a 3-8 guard is a very big difference, um, Plus, you'll be able to have Blitz, so you'll be able to control the attacks. The one downside with Royal West Kents is it itself has a guard, um, which means that your opponent is going to be able to kill Royal West Kents really easily, and you can't protect it behind your buffed-up guard units. Um, so it's going to be somewhat difficult to use this as like a win condition, unless it's like a crazy combo turn, where you, say, give a Hummer guard, which then gives it Blitz, and then you use Tactical Withdrawal and whatnot. Um, but, honestly, it's a it's a solid card. This is the best guard synergy card Britain has ever had before. Um, so, yeah, maybe, maybe guard spam will be interesting in the future. Um, I saw, I forgot who it was, um, but I saw somebody mention this with the Legions, and it might have been Birdo Burrito. Um, and that's a really interesting thought. Britain, Poland, Legions is already, like, a pretty... It, it's a tried and true tested archetype uh, for a control deck. And Royal West Kent seems to fit pretty naturally into that, because it, you can give your tokens Blitz, plus the attack buff, and, um, sorry, not your tokens, your legions, um, and it's relatively easy to summon several of them at once. So, like, you play Royal West Kent's Plan West, double attack, that's nine credits, um, or even Royal West Kent's and the new, um, I'm blanking on the name of it, but Hold the Line, maybe, um, and you'll get a 5-3 immediately. So this is interesting possibilities, interesting cards. And that's what I really like to see from these um, cards being brought back from the reserve pool is cards that kind of push the game and decks in different directions that then currently exist uh, and take terrible cards and turn them into interesting cards. Um, again, like I'm not saying, I don't think any three of these cards are going to see any immediate competitive play uh, and might never see any competitive play but the fact that they are now actually worth thinking about is very fun. So then we get on to Germany, um, and <laughs> Germany's getting back the card Suppression, um, which is a very fun card, because it used to, um, I think it used to reduce the attack of enemy units um, on their turn. 
And then they released the card Effect Suppress, um, and this, this got rotated because it would be very confusing to have a card called Suppression that does not have the Suppress effect. Um, but now it's being brought back with Suppression, so that actually works out pretty well. Uh, it's a one-credit order Suppress Target Unit, so immediately this is very comparable to... Um, I can't believe I'm forgetting the name of the zero-credit um, US Suppress card. But or duress, so it's already very comparable to duress, um, which is zero credits suppress a target. This is one credit suppress a target. Draw a card if you have an air unit, and this is very interesting because Germany historically has had basically no air synergy cards, but also Germany has had some pretty solid air cards that people just run for their own bodies, thinking of cards like Zer Store or FW, uh, obviously the Heinkel, uh, the new Dornier Elite is very strong. So you could very easily fit in a couple suppressions in just like a normal mid-range German deck and somewhat consistently have the air unit to draw a card. And you know, if you are able to draw a card off of this, it is incredibly powerful. And if you're not, it's only slightly worse duress, and duress is a card you would certainly consider running in a deck. Um, and if you're playing it to not draw a card, it's because you are getting a lot of value out of the Suppress effect. So this is a very interesting card. Um, it's a card that I think that we are going to see play, um, and a card that certainly people are going to try out. It's also possible that people just run this with zero air units, or next to zero air units, because it's one credit remove guard. And Germany has, at times, struggled in the past against guard units. Um, so honestly, just running one credit suppress guard or suppress the engineers, for example, to prevent Soviets from healing a ton. If you're not running German ally, this is this is huge, because it basically is giving decks, very aggressive German decks like Heinz, uh, a better shot at um, just, you know, being able to deal with, get around problematic units without having to trade in their entire board into it. Then we have another German card, Breakthrough. Um, so Breakthrough used to be um, sort of a get rid of guard type card. It was, I think, remove guard and ambush and possibly something else, smokescreen maybe, um, from every single enemy unit at once, draw a card. Um, and it it was tried out. Um, remove all guard is really good because it can get rid of guards on either side of the HQ, which is something that, say, Suppress can't deal with. Um, and, you know, three credits draw a card, and on top of that, it's not terrible. Um, it, it just never was really enough, because Germany would rather run cards like Pursuit that maybe had a bit more of a tempo uh, aspect to it. And now New Breakthrough is incredibly powerful. This is one of the best cards, I think, that are going to be coming into the game. Um, and there's also going to be some buffs once we get into the balance changes. Um, but I think Breakthrough might be one of the most important and impactful cards. This card's incredibly powerful. Um, so it's a three credit German order limited. Deal three damage to a target unit. This can be friendly or enemy. If it is destroyed, all of your units operate for one less this turn. So it's essentially like pursuit, but for one credit less. And instead of retreating the unit, you're actually dealing three damage to it, um, which is can situationally be much better. Um, so this is going to allow Germany to have some very big tempo turns in decks, like specifically German Heinz, where you're going to play out a bunch of tanks in your support line, your opponent is going to take, play a bunch of units in their support line and their front line, um, and you're just going to be sitting back and they're going to be doing the normal stuff, like say uh, Jagro or US Frontline, um, where they kind of just have a slight tempo edge on you because you know, Jagger and Frontline just have slightly better cards and slightly more consistent tempo in the early game than German Heinz. And then on a, a specific turn, you're going to be able to slap a breakthrough to destroy a unit. And then you operate your three or four tanks for free to trade out and get uh, favorable trades all across the board and take the front line. And it's going to be a huge tempo swing. And this card is absolutely going to be at least a two of in every single Heinz deck moving forward, I think. Um, because... I mean, Heinz is a deck where if you draw Grife with the, in the first five turns, your win rate probably goes up to like 80, 85%. Um, and Breakthrough is obviously worse than Heinz, or not Heinz, sorry, Heinkel, not Heinkel, Grife. I need to slow my speech down a little bit so I can actually think about what cards I'm saying. Grife, if you draw Grife within the first five turns, um, 
in a Heinz deck, you're probably going to win. Breakthrough is not as good as Grife, but it is giving you extra chances at getting a card with a similar effect that is going to allow you to sort of get that huge tempo swing you need um, to justify running all of these somewhat slower, smaller body tank units by getting to move and attack with them on the same turn for free, um, while still able to establish your, your larger units um, or playing more units or whatever your strategy is. So yeah, Breakthrough, very, very solid card. Um, I'm a little worried it might be too strong. Um, this seems like a very powerful effect, and when you compare it to something like From the People, which is just three credits, deal three damage, end of turn. Obviously, this is a limited, that's a standard, but I feel like the difference between a limited and a standard shouldn't be this powerful of an effect. Uh, and, of course, you can target your own unit, so there is a situation where even if your opponent doesn't have anything on board, you can kill one of your own units to then operate your other units for free. So, for example, you could do 35T, attack face, and then kill your 35T, since it operated for free anyways, and then you can operate the rest of your tanks for free um, to do uh, sort of like a combo turn. And then, last but not least, uh, Germany has pack 40, which again also might be one of the better cards. I don't think this is going to be as impactful um, as uh, Breakthrough, but I think that this is going to be pretty solid. So the pack 40 used to be ambush triple damage to tanks. Uh, it used to be, I think, the only card in the game that said triple, um, which was just really fun. Um, and unfortunately, it no longer says triple, um, but instead it says deployment Destroy target enemy unit that costs two or less. Draw a card if it is a tank. So this is very comparable to Flampanzer, which is destroy target enemy unit that costs one or less. Um, so the the difference between one or less or two or less, uh, two or less, it basically becomes a sudden strike. Um, so you're playing sudden strike on a body that... Uh, the body itself, it's not amazing. Um, four credit for one op, two, two ambush artillery. It's not terrible, but it's not amazing. Artillery... If you can play an artillery with a bonus effect, it's always going to be good because it's, artillery is a must-kill card, and even though it is going to be really easy to kill a 2-2 ambush, it does survive certain things, like, say, a 35T blitzed up. Um, so it is going to survive th through something like that, or just, like, a cavalry regiment trading it. Um, but, you know, it, it's still going to be relatively easy to get rid of this card. But the fact that its deployment effect is so powerful, um, this is going to be a very useful tool, I think, in particularly German mid-range, um, and possibly some German control decks. I don't think it's as good as Sudden Strike in German control, because what Germany kind of struggles with is that they're not really doing anything on turns 2 or 3 if they're not playing a bunch of aggressive units, which is why Sudden Strike is good, because your opponent plays a 2-drop, you play Sudden Strike to remove their 2-drop, and then you move on to playing out your very good 4, 5, 6 cost units, whereas Pack 40 doesn't really fit into that unless maybe you're doing a War Machine. Um, but what also is particularly good about this card, um, obviously, is the fact that it can sometimes draw a card, and not just sometimes, but probably more often than not. Like, if you're playing against Brit Air, you're going to be perfectly happy using this to destroy a buffed-up Swordfish, um, but even then, the, you might catch a Greyhound and still cycle a card. Uh, and if this doesn't cycle a card, it's very comparable to Flam Panzer, which is a card that has seen, like, on and off play for the since it got printed, basically. Um, and if it does draw a card, it's like Flam Panzer on steroids. So, yeah, it, it, most of the time, it's probably going to be catching stuff like Greyhounds, um, like 35Ts, particularly buffed 35Ts off of the Jaeger Regiments. Uh, or the, sorry, the, off the Pants of Grenadiers, um, but it can also be catching very annoying cards like, say, the Pioneer Regiment, or the Engineers Regiment, or Nakshub, um, or sometimes you can pick off, like, a Jaeger Regiment to prevent the card draw, uh, or a Signal Regiment. This is going to be a very, very powerful card, and obviously a lot of what I just said are one-drops, which Flam Panzer could accomplish on its own, um, but this also hits two, and that's a very big difference, because there's a lot of decks that don't run one drops, but basically every single deck runs a one or a two drop. Um, so yeah, pack 40, gonna be a very interesting card, but it's not exactly like a three of immediately in every single deck. Then we have, uh, Soviets, who are getting back Men of Steel, um, which is a card that has seen very limited play. Uh, if you want to find out about how, uh, Men of Steel saw play, you should look up my, uh, cards history video, uh, that I did with Bear. But now, it is maintaining its choose one effect, um, but now the choose one effect is your units get plus one heavy armor, and that's a permanent effect, or 
you add a hammer to your hand. Um, so essentially, it's a four credit hammer, but sometimes it's, you know, sometimes you get heavy armor. I think Men of Steel has been in the game for a very long time. The, op the option of giving all of your units heavy armor for one credit. And it has never been good. Um, and I don't think that's going to change now. Now, obviously, the option of getting a hammer makes this card much better, because it, the other option used to be remove heavy armor from an enemy unit. Um, so, obviously, this is much better than it used to be, um, so it's much easier to run the card. However, it's still difficult to imagine a board-based Soviet main or allied deck where heavy armor is going to play a huge role. Because it's very easy to think of a situation where heavy armor can just win you the game. So, like, for example, you're playing, like, U.S. Soviet frontline versus U.S. German frontline, and you manage to get Men of Steel down on, like, four unit, a four-unit board on, like, turn three, and all U.S. frontline has is unit trading, and they just, you absolutely snowball out the game because they can't kill any of your units. Um, yes, that can happen. Um, but also what can happen is you play Men of Steel on a big board, and then Britain plays, like, carpet bombing, and then it didn't matter that you played Men of Steel. Um, and in control decks, I could see people running this as a fourth or fifth hammer, um, if, like, a very order-heavy, like, almost unitless type deck comes around where you actually want five hammers, uh, I think that is probably the most likely option for this card seed play, but I think people are going to try it out in weird Soviet mid-range decks, and I think it's possible that it will work out. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying, like, this card's never gonna see play. Um, I think it's possible that this card sees play, I just would not, like, you know, hold my breath about it. Um... It's just a little too situational, and it's a little too weak. Um, then we get the SU-85, um, which used to be a pretty bad card, and it's now still kind of a pretty bad card. So it's a 4 cost, 1 operation cost, 5-3 tank, um, with the effect your HQ gains 3 defense when you attack with a Soviet tank. Um, so yeah, this card's absolutely terrible. Uh, like... Soviets like HQ game, and plus three defense per attack, like plus three defense that can trigger multiple dives, is pretty good. Uh, the problem is, there's very few good Soviet tanks, and if you're playing a Soviet tank deck, you do not care about HQ gain whatsoever, and also this doesn't have blitz and it's a 5-3, so it's ludicrously easy for your opponent to remove. And it also, it's not even when Soviet tanks deal damage, it's when they attack, so... If you play this card and then your opponent trades into it, you don't actually gain HQ. This card is genuinely awful. I'm like, it, sure, it's better than it used to be, because I think it used to just, like, deal double damage to tanks or something. Um, but I don't understand why they didn't, like, do, like, a stats change, make it a 3-5. If you made this a 3-5, this would be a lot better, like a 3-5 guard, maybe, even. Um, or maybe, like, a 5-3 a smokescreen. Um where you just, like, sort of try to... It's hard to keep it alive, but you just play it down with Smokescreen, your opponent can't immediately trade into it, and then you try to, like, fire a bunch of HQ gain off of that. They, they could have done so many interesting things with this card to make people at least want to experiment, but as the card is written, is absolutely terrible. This is by far the worst card that is coming back so far. I don't understand why they did this. Like, I don't understand why Soviets can't get any love. Like, there is... 1939 does one of two things with Soviets. It's either they give them the most stupidly powerful elite card that is just super unfun to play with and requires zero thought in deck building. It's just slap it into every Soviet deck and win the game if you draw it. Or Soviets get absolute trash. Um, and this falls into the category of absolute trash. So that's very sad. And then we have the last Soviet card, which is the KV-2. Um, so the KV-2... This one, I think it's worth discussing what it used to be, um, because this is a very interesting card. So obviously, this card coming back is a very big buff to um, self-damage, and obviously self-damage should not run this card, but self-damage, we had a card called Stand Together, which is um, destroy a like an infantry, a friendly infantry, and replace it with a Soviet tank of the same cost, and self-damage runs 34th guards and gets them out for very cheap, which is a 7 cost 6-6 six, six, uh, infantry that gets its cost reduced, um, and you get out 34th guards for very cheap, and then you hit it into something, and then you play stand together, and you turn it into a 7 cost Soviet tank. However, 
KV-2 is the only seven-car Soviet tank, and then they rotated it so you could, couldn't could play stand together anymore, and that is one of the many reasons self-damage uh, completely vanished from the meta. KV-2 coming back makes self-damage immediately on the map. Is it going to be good? Is it going to struggle against certain things? Um, like, I don't think it's going to come back to its heyday of a, as a Tier 1 deck, but I think this might put self-damage back on the map as something you can consider for a tournament and consider for, um, like, general ladder play. Now, is this KV-2 better than the former KV-2? Um, and I've seen a lot of people say that this is just better than the former KV-2. Um, I think that they're actually very similar in strength, and it's kind of hard to say which is better. So first, I'll say, what are the benefits of this card? The former card was three operation costs, this is two operation costs, so obviously that's just immediately, it's one credit cheaper to do a um, stand-together attack with KV-2, and it's two credits cheaper to do stand-together in the support line, push, and attack with KV-2. Also, this KV-2 has seven attack, compared to the former KV-2's six attack, um, so it just does one more attack, and that's not going to be super relevant a lot of the time, but one more attack is one more attack. And this KV-2's text is very different. So, Heavy Armor 2, and this one says, Order damage to a friendly unit is reduced by its heavy armor. So, this basically makes heavy armor actually apply to, um, or against orders, and this applies to all of your units. So, you know, maybe you, you can run this with the new Men of Steel, where you slam down a KV-2, and then you play Men of Steel, and then your board is actually immune to carpet bombing. It makes Men of Steel better. Problem is, this is not immune to things such as Lion for a day, or uh, Honor and Loyalty, and that will get rid of its effect, and then they can play carpet bombing, and your day is ruined. Um, so, it's not a terrible effect. Uh, so, for example, it actually keeps it alive through Hammer. Hammer would only deal 4 damage to this unit, Bloody Sickle would deal 0 damage to this unit, Carpet Bombing would only deal 1 damage to this unit. It does make this unit really, really sticky in a lot of situations. Um, however, the previous KV-2 had the text, cannot be pinned, cannot be attacked by air units or artillery. And that might just be better. Um, and so what I mean by this is, I think if you were to play it in your deck, this version of KV-2 in front of us is just strictly better. I think it might be slightly better to have gotten the previous KV-2 in stand, uh, off of stand together in a self-damaged deck, exclusively just because you could often do it against certain decks like, a say, a German midrange or a Britain Air, decks that rely on these planes to trade out, um, and you would basically just get a KV-2 as quickly as possible just to try to create this huge unit in the front line that they have to, like, spam down blitz units to try to get rid of. Um, whereas, if you're playing against a control deck, yes, this version is harder for control to deal with, and control will typically not be trading it down with um, air units or artillery. Uh, however, control also could typically just remove this with, like, like again, like a line for a day, the Dechima, the whatever, just immediately destroy order, like, B-17s, ASW patrol, whatever it is. Um, and then the other thing is, cannot be pinned is also a very good thing, because a lot of decks will, might then try to pin this to buy themselves time. Um, so again, I'm not saying that this is clearly worse. Um, I think as a in standalone card, it is much better, but I think you are definitely losing out on some of what made KV-2 really good in self-damage against certain decks. Um, but anyways, let's move on to the U.S., because the U.S. is actually getting some very, very interesting cards. Uh, and that's not something you say very often <laughs> about the U.S. So the first up is B-26 Marauder. Um, this is an elite that really never saw much love. Um, people tried to play it, but it was just very silly, and also a very toxic uh, card effect. It used to be whatever this unit attacks the enemy HQ, give all enemy units plus two operation cost. Um, you'd basically just try to get it out as quickly as possible, and then just permanently, like, lock their board with high operation cost. Now, it is a 4 cost, 2 operation, bomber, 3, 4, heavy armor 1, your non-targeting deployment effects trigger twice. So this is kind of a weird thing, but basically any deployment effect that doesn't require you to pick a target prior to the effect triggering, will trigger twice when you play it while Marauder is on the board. So, for example, a card like B-17, if you play Marauder and then you play B-17, since you don't choose the target, 
B-17 will trigger twice and destroy two random enemy units. Or if you play Marauder and then Sherman, Sherman will draw four cards rather than two cards because it will trigger twice. But if you play Marauder and then you play, um, I don't know, like Mosquito, which is deal three damage to target unit, um, Marauder will not do deal six damage to that target unit. It will not let you deal three damage to two targets. It will simply deal the, the three damage. Um, so it's, it's very difficult to evaluate how good this is going to be, because obviously you could very easily think of like the super greedy ramp situations where they they ramp up to like 13 credits super fast, and then they do Marauder B-17 and laugh at their power. Um, but I mean, most of the time that deck's just going to get rolled over by Jagro, so how much of a serious competitive impact is this going to have? Can you run this in a deck like Frontline? Um, like, how many deployment effects in Frontline are you going to be able to trigger? Because Jaeger is targeted, Scout Car is targeted, 99th is targeted, um, it is, like, Half Track is targeted, M10 is targeted. U.S. Frontline has a lot of deployment effects, but Sherman is kind of the only one that I can think of off the top of my head that is not targeted. Um, I guess 35T isn't targeted, but that doesn't matter. Um, Jaeger is another one that isn't targeted, but... I mean, whether or not you actually run Jaeger in Frontline, it would make the deck a lot heavier, and Frontline is also doesn't have the credits to play this out very cheap, so it's a bit of a commitment to play this card and then hope it survives for a turn. And at that point, why don't you just play a card like Catalina, which is a 3-5 thing, and then it gives you immediate bonus effect if it survives a turn, rather than, than needing to do a different play on top of that. Um, and then if, you know, you're, you're getting up to turn 9 and you're doing, like, Marauder like, 164th push-up Sherman, draw four cards, why don't you instead just play, like, research, research, like, upgrade research twice? Um, so I don't think it's going to be good in frontline. Um, it's just too hard to use. I think it's going to be a card that might see play in ramp, um, because it will also trigger card effects twice, like a Glamour Boys, to gain eight defense, uh, eight defense, and also ramp is going to be able to get to the credits to play cards with Marauder, um, at the same time, faster, and it's also going to have guards and orders to protect Marauder better. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it'll be, see some play, also Milk Truck, um, but like, you know, I, I think, I don't think it's, I don't think US Main Ramp is going to be good, um, like isn't great, and I don't think this is going to have any immediate competitive impact beyond somebody just bringing a very heavy ramp deck to call out control. Then we look at Overwhelming Force, which um, is possibly seen the biggest change from what it used to do. Because Overwhelming Force used to be a zero credit, um, like reset the attack and remove destruction and ambush and guard and smokescreen. Uh, it, it used to essentially be suppress, before suppress was a keyword. Um, and then suppress became a keyword and they released duress and this just became strictly worse duress. Um, now, Overwhelming Force is back, with the card text, Choose and discard a unit, give its attack and defense to a target-friendly infantry or tank. Uh, now, the wording on this card is slightly confusing, um, but it, when it says choose and discard a unit, that is choose and discard a unit from your hand. Um, so, it is essentially, you are losing two cards and five credits to give get an immediate bonus on board. So very easy, like people could very easily think of the, the great situation of you get um, the Super Fortress, either you run it in your deck or you get it off of Barber Mafia or Ingenuity or you get it off of um, Stage 2 US Research, and then you play Overwhelming Force and you discard Super Fortress, uh, for, so you give a unit plus 9 plus 9 for just 5 credits and then you attack with that unit and you win the game. Um, the issue is that's not a good deck. Like, maybe you could build some, like, sort of wacky tier 3, low tier 3 combo deck around that, where you're running multiple ways to get Super Fortress, and there's other, like, big cost units you can theoretically boost it off of, and then your, your entire deck is built around, you know, getting this on, like, a Greyhound or something. But, it, just generally speaking, it's a really terrible card. Um, and... Yes, there's a lot of high roll potential. Like, theoretically, you could just run Overwhelming Force and Super Fortress in your deck, and a small percentage of the time, on turn 5, you will give, like, a zero operation cost 35T or uh, 164th plus 9 plus 9 and swing face and win the game. Um, but if you run Overwhelming Force and Super Fortress in your deck, 
you are going to lose a lot more games because those cards are in your hand and suck than you will win games because you get it off on turn 5. Um, so, this is not nearly as bad as a card like, say, Partnership, which would allow you to just sometimes get a turn 5 Super Fortress, um, and sometimes you get a turn 5 Jasko. Um, but there is substantially, like, the the cost on your deck is much higher because you have to build your deck around this card, um, and I think that's fine. I, I don't love this type of card design, but I think it's fine to have these sort of do super wacky high roll stuff if you build your deck around it. So cards like Special Assignment or whatever the French card was called, um, where, you know, you could cheat out these big units, um, similar to Machines of War in Soviets, where it's like, yes, you can cheat out big units, and there is a certain amount of RNG to doing that early, um, but also, like, you do have to make some pretty severe restrictions on your deck to accomplish this, and that is good, whereas a card like Partnership does not require any deck restrictions, and you can just throw that out there. Um, so yeah, overall, before us, I don't think it's going to make that big of a splash beyond just, like, you know, I, 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 I await the Spruce video, um, where the Spruce absolutely wreck some fools with overwhelming voice. That will be very fun to watch, but I don't think you're going to see this much on ladder. Then we get to the A24 Banshee, and this is another card that's honestly very difficult to evaluate, um, because I've seen some people saying that this card is absolutely insane, um, and my first reaction to this card was that this card kind of sucks. Um, now that I've had more time to think about it, I think this card still kind of sucks. Uh, <laughs> so, like, there's going to be times where you pick this card off of Barber Mafia, um, and it does good things. But the reason that um, I think this card, for the most part, sucks is, like, people are imagining these situations where, like, you have 15 credit slots, and you play Banshee at the start of your turn, and it's a 6 credits deal 9 damage to a unit. Um, th my problem with that is, first of all, how often are you on 15 credits and your opponent has a 9 health unit on the board? Um, second of all, if they do, wouldn't it just be easier to play a card like B17, um, and destroy that unit? Like, do they really have a 9 health unit and also a ton of other units? And if they do, don't you still lose the game because they have a ton of other units? And if you have an AoE for the other units, why wouldn't you just play the AoE and then B17? Um, yeah, I, I don't see these situations happening. Um, and then the other thing is that this card... <laughs> Compared to, like, a B-17, yes, you play B-17 on turn 9, and sometimes, like, you, you hit 9 credits, and you throw it a B-17, and you pray it hits the good thing. Um, A-24 Banshee, you throw it out on turn 9, and you can deal 3 damage to a target enemy, and then you still have 3 credits to work with. Um, but the body is substantially worse. Um, it... I just don't see this card being particularly good. Like, you just have better things to do with ramp, and ramp did not need more big... Like, it's not even a big unit. It's a very small unit. It's just that ramp didn't need more expensive units for single-target removal. Ramp has a lot of big units and single-target removal. What ramp needs is survivability. And tempo. And this is not a tempo card particularly. Like, yes, it, it technically does something when you play it, but just the fact that it's absolutely useless until, like, at least nine credits, and at nine credits, it's still, like, kind of just a worse Mosquito, which is a card that doesn't even see play. Um, yeah, it's like, you need to have at least ten credit slots for this card to actually start to be something you want in your deck. Um, and yeah, it, it's not that good of a card. But again, like, there's going to be situations where you, you pick this card off of, um, like, a Bomber Mafia, and then you play it to deal 6 damage and take out your opponents, like, Saxton or FW or something. Um, then we get on to Japan, and we get to the, the first Japanese card that's coming back is Shibata Regiment. This used to be the uh, laughing stock of Japanese cards, um, because it would the unit would literally kill itself before it could do anything. Now Shibata is a 1 cost, 1-3 one infantry with 1 operation cost, when the enemy gives an order deal 2 damage to the enemy HQ. So it's the, um, is it the Utsunomiya? I think it's the Utsunomiya, which is the 4-6 that has the same card text. Um, 5 cost, 4-6. That's a card that people have tried before, and 
it has worked to some success, because as it turns out, most decks and cards run a ton of orders, and two damage to the enemy HQ is very significant. Like, it, it, it is incredibly significant. Um, and Shibata, being a one-cost Japanese unit, with this effect, is absolutely insane. I know a lot of people have looked at this card and were like, well, it doesn't have Blitz anymore, so, like, is it really that good? Um, yes, yes, it is absolutely that good. Because, guess what? You don't always draw a one-cost Blitzer on turn one, and guess what? Playing a one-cost Blitzer on turn one is not always the correct thing to do. A lot of people will play Recon on turn one, because then they can push it up and, um, they can either, like, if the opponent pushes a one cost up, they can trade with it, um, and if they don't, they can push it up and play expansion, or they can on turn two push up a Blitz unit and play expansion. Shibata on turn one is better than Recon on turn one by a pretty substantial margin. Like, I'm not saying that it is a better card than Recon, um, it might be, but it is, on turn one, it is a better play than Recon because it can't be one shot by 35T which means it sticks around, and if your opponent doesn't trade into it with their 35T, you can do Type 93 and hit their 35T. And if they don't take the front line, you can push a 1-3 into the front line, which basically solidifies the front line. And, as well, if your opponent is not doing other, other aggro tempo stuff, your opponent is likely going to be doing car playing cards like Sudden Strike, playing cards like um, the War Machine, and this is going to be dealing 2 damage to them, which is the equivalent of hitting them with a 35T. So yes, this card doesn't have Blitz, but it is ludicrously powerful. And I've also seen a lot of people say, well, oh, this card falls off in the late game, you know? Like, later in the game, you just play down some Shibata regiments and they're one three bodies, the opponent trades into them. Okay, but if you're playing Japan and the opponent has the front line, you've lost the game regardless of what you are drawing, so I don't understand that argument. And if your opponent doesn't have the front line, but you're saying your opponent will just simply remove them with removal orders, well, it's still dealing the damage to them. Um... And it also means that they have to then kill Shibata before they can play removal on anything else. So if you, say, play a Dragon Slayer and a Shibata late in the game at the same time, they have to kill the Shibata first before they can deal with the Dragon Slayer, and they might not be able to do both things at the same time, so they might have to kill the Dragon Slayer, and then Shibata deals the two damage. And guess what? Two damage from one Shibata is 10% of your opponent's starting health, and you're playing Jagro. So, yeah, Shibata's an absolutely cracked card. Like, this card... um. I said Breakthrough is maybe the best card coming back. I kind of forgot about Shibata. Shibata might be the best card coming back. Breakthrough and Shibata, both absolutely insane cards. Um, and I'm, I, like, I, I don't think 1939 isn't aware of how strong this card is. I think it might be an intentional addition to try to bring back more traditional unit-based decks at the expense of creating more problems for order-based decks. Because, just historically speaking, 1939 has really, really disliked order-heavy decks. They want the game to use units, because guess what? Cards' core unique mechanics, being operation cost and the front line, both revolve around units. Um, and then I guess the third, like, unique thing about cards would be, like, unit types. So yeah, like, everything that makes cards unique is the unit aspects to the game, so 1939 does not like decks that largely ignore units and just simply play a lot of orders. Um, and Shibata seems to be their push in that direction, because guess what? If everybody's playing Shibata, people will stop playing um, order-heavy decks, because order-heavy decks will get wrecked by Shibata, and people will then move to decks, say, like Frontline, where Frontline runs next to no orders, um, and can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a card like Shibata when fighting for the Frontline, and that will then move people, you know, away from order-heavy control, and then if frontline is very popular, you're going to see things like um, Soviets control or German control come back, where they're very unit-based control decks that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with frontline. Um, so hopefully we see this big cascade away from, like, the retributions and the mills and the ramp decks at, towards back into unit um, unit based gameplay, and I think that that's probably their intention with Shibata. I think that's, like, why Shibata is just so ludicrously overpowered, uh, and I hope once we get to that point, at some point in the future, Shibata will be nerfed some months down the line after it has served its purpose, because holy crap, this card is insane, and I don't want this card to just exist in the game for the next, like, two years. Uh, then we get to down to Outmaneuver, um, and this is a very fun card, so, Outmaneuver is a one-credit Japanese order. Target Japanese unit has a zero operation cost this turn. If it has smokescreen, it gets plus two, plus two. So, obviously, 
this is quite strong with cards that have smokescreen. It has to be Japanese only, so you can't use this to give some crazy pop-off turns very early with, like, say, a Soviet AA gun, where you make a turn two, three, three arty, or, um, say, a turn two Panzer A, where you make a three, five, um, tank on turn two. Japan's smokescreen units are generally weaker than other nations' smokescreen units, um, or at least in terms of they're generally slower. Um, so it's less of a snowball card and more of a calculated, interesting card that fits into a smokescreen deck. Um, it does sort of ha ha take some issue um, with just how does the smokescreen deck work exactly. I don't really know, but it's a very powerful effect. And honestly, I think we might see this card as just a essentially Japanese land for the free, land of the free, um, because we've seen decks use, um, it's not Rule Disguise, Dawn Operations. We've seen decks use Dawn Operations before to reduce the operation cost of Sheedon um, from three to zero, and that's a two credit card. Outmaneuver is a one credit card, so even though Sheedon doesn't have Smokescreen, um, you can still just use this to reduce Sheedon's operation cost to zero um, for a turn. So, you know, it can just be used in combo cards like that. Um, but overall, I think it's very interesting. Um, I like that they managed to make Smokescreen not about just high rolling the hell out of your opponent. Um, so we'll have to see where this goes. And then last but not least, they have the 114th Infantry Regiment. Um, this one I'm a little sad about because I actually really liked the previous version of this card. I actually played it a couple times. I tried it out as like a two of in certain Japanese um, Feigned Retreat decks as just, like, a bit of a heavier unit, because it used to be a 4-3 unit deployment, um, give a target-friendly unit plus one attack and minus one operation cost to this turn. Um, so yeah, it used to just be, like, a fun little tempo card that you could use, um, to play on units that would have operation cost to continue putting the pressure down on the board and get a bit of a bigger unit out there. Now, it is a, uh, self-credit denial card, but it's a very bad self-credit denial card. So it's a 3 cost, 0 operation cost, 3-3. Three, three. Destruction, deal damage to the enemy HQ equal to the credit slots you have lost this battle. Um, so this is by far the worst of the credit denial payoff cards. Um, because, let's be real, you're not running this with crazy destruction effect or duplication effects. And it's kind of difficult to deny yourself more than, like, 5 credits over the course of a game. Um, without just winning the game with a card like the Great Expanse. Um, and, you know, if this is Destruction, deal 5 damage to the enemy, it's not that good. Like, if, the, if it was just Destruction, deal 5 damage to the enemy without needing to deny yourself 5 credit slots, yes, it would be crazy. Um, but if you've denied yourself 5 credit slots, what you're looking to do is play uh, 1 Roof, Great Expanse, and then win the game with Blitz units, and this just does absolutely not fit into that game strategy at all. You are not going to run this in self-credit denial. This is kind of a stinker card. I don't really know why they added it. Um, but oh well. And then um, the next card makes me irrationally angry, so we're just going to scroll down and look at the the other two Allied Nation cards first. Um, so Poland is getting Hell back, which is a two-credit order. Um, give your Legion, give a Legion's unit plus six defense, and your HQ is immune to damage. So I've seen a lot of people freaking out about this card. Um, I actually think this card is bait. I think this card will not be played in any... I don't think this card will be played in any good um, Legion stack. And I also think that this card is worse than the previous version of Hell. I wish they had just brought back the previous version of Hell. I genuinely don't... Like, this is... Out of all of the cards that they, they have changed here and are bringing back, basically everything else never saw play. Like, never saw play, none of this saw play, none of this saw play, like, this saw play once, this saw play because you could get it for free, this, like, saw play once, this saw regular tournament play up until they, like, and it saw regular play in the decks it was intended to be played in up until the point where they rotated it, and now they have brought it back in a worse version. I'm, like, actually really mad about this. I loved Hell and was, uh, like, sad when they rotated it, and now they've killed it. Um, but I should probably talk about why I don't think this card is very good, because I'm sure a lot of you are confused, because you see two credits give a unit plus six defense, and 
an additional effect. That is a lot. So, you know, if you play, like, turn 3, plan west, turn 4, hell, you can make a 2-8 guard that also makes you immune, HQ immune to damage, which means, uh, say, bombers from Brit Air can no longer go face, signal, dam signal regiment um, will stop going face. Um, actually, an important thing that I just sort of realized about this card is uh, the other HQ is immune to damage effects is on your turn or the opponent's turn. This is both turns, so you could, like, theoretically play this in, like, self-damage, um, as well as blocking enemy damage. Um, but the reason it's not good is because it doesn't have intel, and it's not an exile card. So this is guaranteed to take up one of your 12 Polish slots in a deck that has to be a Legion's deck, because it has to target a Legion's, um, and my question is, how is that ever better than just running more intel cards or legion generation cards? Um, because, like, if you play this with, say, like, two Tardows, and, um, like, you do two Tardows, three Plan Wests, and three, um, Hold the Lines, and then you run, like, a Hell. Okay, but at that point, that's, what, nine Polish slots and you have just the, the stand together as intel cards, and you want to be playing those early anyways, you don't want to be saving those as intel cards. And then you have, like, three slots remaining for, like, what, Karis, Karis, but you also want to fit in Uprising, um, and maybe two Uprising, and then you only have one Karis. So, like, unless you're playing Britain, every other nation does not have access to enough intel cards to make that worth it, and Tarnow is absolutely better than Hell. Um, also, you know, you play Hell, and then your opponent retreats it, or suppresses it, um, I don't know. It is is just a really, really weak card. You also, like, play Hell and they Sudden Strike it. Um, just, you, your opponent's going to be able to answer it, and it doesn't do anything immediately. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't let you make a big trade, it doesn't destroy a unit, it doesn't trigger intel, it doesn't buff any of your other legions, it doesn't tr trigger tie now. It is just a big, fat, nothing card. And yes, it's very easy for this card to be good, and I think people are absolutely going to try it out, and it might even see, like, some people might even bring this card to tournament. Don't get me wrong. I think that it is just makes your deck strictly worse to put this card in it at the cost of other Polish cards, if you were playing a Legion's deck. Um, and I will have to be convinced otherwise. <laughs> um, but again, it's, it's not a terrible card. If, if you don't have a full collection of Polish cards, by all means, put hell in your deck. Um, Although, you should probably just not be playing Legions if you don't have a full collection of Legions cards, but th that's my thoughts on Hell. Um, then we have the Savoia Marchetti, um, which used to be an absolutely awful card. Just, like, an absolutely terrible card. Um, and now it's pretty interesting. So it's a 4-cost, 2-operation cost, 3-3 three, three Italian Bomber deployment, trigger a non-targeted deployment effect on a friendly unit. Um, so, essentially, it's like the Marauder that we saw previously for the US, except you can play this afterwards, and that makes it a lot better in terms of if you could be able to consistently trigger an effect. So, for example, now you can play Sherman on turn 4, and then you can play Savoia Barchetti on turn 5 targeting the Sherman, and if you still have a US unit in the front line, um, you will then draw two cards, whereas... With the Marauder, you have to play Marauder on turn 4, and then keep the front line, and keep the Marauder alive, and then play Sherman. Um, so yeah, this is a better effect than the Marauder in for a, like, tempo mid-range aggressive list. Um, the issue is it's an Italian, um, and Italy doesn't really have any good non-targeted deployment effects. Um, and the question is, what deck would willingly sacrifice their ally slot to be Italy to get the Savoia Marchetti, and it's kind of difficult to imagine. Something that is worth noting about this card is um, it can be used to do uh, elites, because it is itself not an elite, unlike the Marauder. Um, so you can do, say, Leopold, and then you play Savoia Marchetti on the Leopold, if the Leopold sticks, to then trigger Leopold again <laughs> without it having to leave the board um, in, like I say, a German-Italy control deck, but that seems like you're you put in too many cards in your deck to do too little. Um, so I'm pretty solidly unconvinced by this card. Um, but it's going to be fun, and maybe people can figure out a way to make it work. Um, if not now, but maybe in the future. And then I suppose we should talk about 
sabotage. Um, I hate this card so much. This is the card I'm the least happy about um, in probably, like, the last two years of cards. Why? I understand we work in Sabotage, don't get me wrong. The old Sabotage kind of sucked, and fit Resistance, and they don't like Resistance anymore, so they're getting rid of it. Why do, Just make this into a Resistance card. I think people would prefer this to be a Resistance card than its current version. And 1939 is aware of this. Like, if you read the thing they here, they say, um, finally, we come to a card that people will love to hate and hate to love. Um, and they even say, um, the cost may be high on this one, but the effect may and will bring grown men to their knees crying when their beloved win con is stolen. What a nice Manhattan project you have there, sir. Yoink. So the 1939 is fully aware of what this card is going to do to the game. I, I don't understand. So with Shibata, um... Shibata, I said, was a card that is purposefully very strong to push the game into a direction that they want. And I have to imagine that is the same with Sabotage, but I don't understand the direction that they want to push the game in with with this card change. Because, yes, maybe maybe they just hate OTK. Maybe they're very sad, like sick and tired of OTK decks who continually reappearing, so they're putting in Sabotage so that there's a way to counter decks that have specific card win cons. Um, beyond just random discard, Sabotage is essentially like random discard, but um, it's slightly better random discard. Um, but then why do you add a copy of it to your hand? Why isn't this just five credits, choose one of three cards in the enemy hand and discard it? Like, I don't understand why that would be a French card. France has never had, like, offensive discard on anything. France has never had any discard um, beyond, like, resistance. So I, it doesn't fit the theme at all. Um, it, it also, like, why why are you stealing the card? What does, like, sabotage have to do with, like, stealing your opponent's Manhattan project? But okay. Um, so it doesn't fit the theme of the card. It doesn't fit the theme of the nation. And now let's talk about possibly the uh, unintended consequences of this card. Because very clearly the card does seem to be targeting, like, decks that have single card win cons. But as a result, um, you know, you you just, like, completely throw control mirrors out the window if one of them is France Ally. And France Ally in control mirrors was already a pretty common thing after Italy Ally was probably the most common control ally, um, just it, it looking at the last three years of cards. And this is just so silly. It's like... It, you're, okay, so you're, you're playing a control beer. You know, just a normal unit-based control beer that 1939 likes. Nobody's doing fatigue blocking, nobody's doing order spamming, nobody's doing infinite retributions, or mill, or OTKs. It's just straight unit-to-on-unit control mirrors. And then one person plays a sabotage and steals the opponent's 272nd. Or they steal the opponent's Leopold. Or possibly they steal the opponent's Comet. Or, you know, they they steal the opponent's big unit, the big control unit that 1939 wants. And not only is it 7 credits discard, so essentially destroy the opponent's big enemy threat, but you also get one for yourself. That is insane. Um, so, like, it's... You could compare this card to... Um, I'm forgetting what the card, the name is off the top of my head, but the uh, British Elite, the 7 cost like, uh, remove an enemy unit from the board and add it into your deck, like, shuffle it into your deck. Um, like, it, it's like that, which already at the time was already, like, a bit of a, ooh, I don't know about that one moving forward. Um, but at least it's a British elite, and Britain is a nation that has struggled for big units, so, okay, that this is sort of the most fair way to do it. And now they're just throwing in Sabotage, which is a three of that you could run in any nation that is even better because it gives you three shots at removing not just a unit, but you can also use it to take away a key board clear. Um, you know, take Depths of Winter away from Soviets. You, you play the Control Mirror and you steal Depths of Winter off of Soviets. And it's not like it's just like, oh, you know, play the card out f quickly. Depths of Winter is going to be a card 
that a good player is going to hold back until the last possible moment to get the most value out of it, and now they're just going to have the possibility that the opponent is randomly going to be able to steal Depths of Winter, which is just like an immediate game-ending tempo swing. Not not tempo swing, but value swing in terms of just like the overall value of, that each deck is able to bring forward. I... I'm so... Like... Why is anyone ever going to play Control anymore? Because everyone's just going to sabotage. Like, yeah, sabotage sucks against aggro. I mean, like, not really. It's situationally going to be pretty good against aggro. Um, but, like, yeah, sabotage sucks against aggro. Well, guess what? Control runs cards that are bad against aggro. Um, and if you're running sabotage in your deck, it means you could actually cut down on how much, like, heavy cards you are running. Because why would you run heavy cards for yourself when you can instead just run sabotage? Um, which, you know, takes up the spot of a heavy card in your deck, but it also s destroys a enemy heavy card at the same time. Um, yeah, I, I hate this card. But, that is it for the reserve cards. Um, and again, like I said, I think that these are going to be more impactful. Um, the British ones, not so much. Um, but Suppression, I think, is going to see play. Breakthrough is going to see play. Pack 40 is going to see play. Um, KV2 is going to see play through self-damage. Um, you're going to probably see a lot of Marauders, just because, you know, Baru Buffy is still a card that exists. Um, Shibata, you're going to see a lot of. Um, Sabotage, you're going to see. And, I mean, you're probably going to see Hell, let's be honest, but... That brings us to the end of the, um, reworked cards, and now we will get into the cards and balance changes. Alrighty, so, now we come to the balance changes, which, um, to be honest, are a tad disappointing. Um... So, at, at the upfront, they say, as a whole, the meta is in a pretty healthy place. Um, I don't think the community would agree with you on that one, but okay. There's no dominating decks, and many different archetypes thrive. Nevertheless, there is room for improvement. The retribution mechanic continues to polarize the player base. Plus, it hurts the viability of various other decks. One of the new kids on the block, the French Mill deck, has also become slightly too big for its breaches and needs a slight adjustment. As always, we round out things with a few key buffs to support or enable new decks. Um, and then, before they get into the other cards, um, they would talk about the new change to, um, a, a certain other cards. So these are changes that functionally, for the most part, stay the same. Um, so basically they are updating cards to work with their new mechanics. So the first one is, um, Uprising. So, um, here, let me actually pull these cards over slightly. So yeah, Uprising, um, used to you have to target a unit, um, and that was because that was how you would display how much damage it would deal, is you would target it at a unit, and it would say, like, deals X amount of damage to the unit, or it would say it will kill the unit. Um, now it just says deal damage to all uh, units equal to the number of portals units destroy this battle, which is the same effect, but now because they have the ability to track how much damage the card is going to deal in hand, um, which you've probably seen through things like um, the... Uh, diplomatic attaché, um, and stuff like that. So now it will just say, like, deal damage to all units, or equal to Polish units destroy this battle, and then it will, in brackets, it will say the number of deals. Um, this one has a slight gameplay difference in that your opponent can no longer stop Uprising with cards like Secret Operatives, which would stop an order from being targeted on their units. You could already get around that by targeting your own unit with Uprising, um, but, you know, maybe you don't have units on board, so this is a, a very, very minor buff to Uprising, um, but for the most part, um, it doesn't matter. Um, then we have Feigned Retreat, which is functionally the exact same, but instead of, um, it now says your HQ gets when you deploy a unit this battle draw card. Um, so, essentially, it already would track this effect on your HQ, but they're essentially changing game altering effects, like permanent game altering effects, to be tied to the HQ. Um, part of this might just be clarity, um, because people now know where to look, and get to more easily track what game altering effects are at play. And two, I think this means that in the future they might add cards that allow you to remove um, game altering effects from the opponent's HQ, like maybe like suppress the opponent's HQ or something. Um, although I don't, s I find it very difficult to imagine how you would make that card in a way that's not just like incredibly polarizing. Because you know, if you play Feigned Retreat and then your opponent immediately plays that card, you lose the game. Just immediately, you lose the game. Um, 
it, it's not even funny. Like, you discard your entire hand, and then you don't actually get your draw engine. The game's over. Um, so yeah, I don't know how you would build that in a way that doesn't just kind of suck. But Feigned Retreat is still in reserve, so, you know, it, it doesn't actually really matter at the moment. And then we have Contest Doctrine, um, which likewise is saying your HQ gets thanks you deploy this battle, get plus one, plus one. I think a more interesting thing that they could do, rather than giving the opponent a way to suppress enemy HQs, is possibly give the opponent a way to replace HQs with something else. Um, so, you know, like, both players get a new HQ that, you know, like, you could then, like, have it literally change the HQ, maybe make a new board or something to have a cool animation tied to that. And then also, it replaces their previous effects, but, like, maybe it gives them a new effect, um, something like that. Rather than, like, if they just have, like, a suppress HQs, I think that would kind of suck. Um, then we get down into the actual nerfs. Um, well, kind of. So, Yank is now also, uh, your HQ gains this battle the first time you develop each turn, also develop a Retribution. Um, but it's going from 6 credits to 7 credits. So, Yank is now 7 credits. Um, this is a brutal nerf to Retribution. Like, and Yank was already so difficult to play, um, and now it's even harder to play. At, at the end of the day, though, it's probably not going to matter a ton, because, honestly, like, you would play Yank against... Like, you would never have the opportunity to play Yank against, like, an aggro deck. Um, you would exclusively play Yank against a control deck on a turn where they're not doing anything, and you're still able to do that. Um, but, yeah. Then, Outrage. So, this is the card generated from, like, Fuhrer from the, I forget the number, but the 5-4 um, infantry with destruction added Outrage um, from Blue and Grey. All of the Outrage generation cards, well, they will now give you a 2-credit Outrage instead of the 1-credit Outrage. And this is a huge nerf to Retribution. This is a much bigger nerf than um, the Yank nerf. And this is also just a huge nerf to decks running the, I think it's like a 154th? I want to say 151st. Um, huge nerf to the decks running that 5-4 Infantry. Um, because that card just on its own was really good, regardless of needing an entire Retribution deck built around it. Um, so, Outrage going to 2 is a pretty big nerf to that card. Um, and the fact that Retribution is eating 2 nerfs is wild. This really shows how far 1939 is willing to go for decks that they do not like in their game. Because think about, like, think about self-credit, or not self-credit denial, think about regular credit denial. How long did we deal with regular credit denial? How long did we deal with Brit Air and, like, the the incremental nerfs to Brit Air that accomplished absolutely nothing? Um, that's because 1939 wanted those decks to exist. I don't know why, but they did. Um, whereas if 1939 does not want a deck to exist, just look at what they've done to Retribution in the last, like, two patches. Because Retribution, y you can complain about Retribution, and that's perfectly valid. I'm not gonna, like, I'm not gonna go after anybody for complaining about Retribution. But it is not a good archetype. It is, it just really isn't. It is It is not that good of an archetype from a competitive point of view. It's very easy to go after. It's very easy to counter. And honestly, like, it's not even particularly better. Th like, it's not better at countering control decks than other anti-control deck strategies you could go for. Um, and, like, they're just going after it. They're butchering Retribution. Um, which I just find kind of amusing, because it's like, man, it really shows you how much they didn't care about other decks in the past. Um, then we have a third US change. This is to another, um, generated card, like Outrage. This is to the B24J, so you can get this off of, um, Bomber Mafia, you can get this off of, um, the, the production order, the in original way to get it off of, and I, you might be able to get it off of Ingenuity, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but what B24J used to say is deployment suppress all enemy units, uh, and what it says now is um, deployment suppress target enemy unit and adjacent unit. So there's actually counterplay to it. It's no longer just a full, complete, and utter AOE suppress. Um, and that's really cool. I'm happy that they did this change. And this is probably going to be most impactful off of Bomber Mafia, because I feel like B24J got picked off of Bomber Mafia much more often than it got picked off of uh, Production Order. At least relative to the B24D. Um, however, this is still not enough to me. Um, one, Bomber Mafia should not be able to generate this card, and two, Production Order by itself is still, like, a stupidly powerful card, and they need to nerf B24D 
more. And by no, I mean, I think they should just nerf both of them more. I think they should both go down to five attack. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Um, this is a good change, but again, very, very conservative change. And then we get to Mill. What are they doing to Mill? Well, Honor and Loyalty is going from two credits to three credits, uh, and this is very good. Um, this is something that I actually suggested before Compromise even existed, and that was not just me like, you know, oh, I saw a Compromise in the IT servers, so I, I knew it was coming down the pipeline. No, I, I just f fully saw that Honor and Loyalty at two credits was an insane card that would cause problems in the, uh, it would cause problems in the future, and then it caused problems in the future, and I'm not the only one who said that, of course. Um, but yeah, Honor and Loyalty, absolutely cracked card. Going from two credits to three credits is a very healthy change for the game. Um, it's also going to drastically slow down these sort of wombo combo turns, because Mill is very... The, the strength of Mill is when they're able to play multiple forced draw cards in the same turn, not just forced draw in general. So, you know, it, the worst part of Mill is when it's turn eight, and you have seven cards in hand, and then they play Compromise, Compromise, Honor, and Loyalty. Or, like, it's turn nine, and you have seven cards in hand. They do Compromise, Honor, and Loyalty, Honor, and Loyalty, Honor, and Loyalty, and then you you are forced to overdraw, like, seven cards. So it's basically just it absolutely annihilates your deck. So from going from two credits to three credits, yes, on a turn where they are just playing Honor and Loyalty, that's not a big difference, but where the big difference comes in is when they're stacking multiple of them in a row on the same turn. So that's going to may mean that it is going to be easier for you to get the cards that you want from your deck into your hand, because you will have more opportunity to dump the cheap, bad cards you don't care about from your hand, so that they'll still be able to force you to draw the same amount of cards, and you will still reach fatigue at about the same rate. But the difference is they will not overdraw, like, half your deck in the process anymore. Um, they'll only overdraw, like, a third of your deck, or a quarter of your deck, maybe. Um, so, you know, that's that's a very good change. Um... And then we scroll down, and that's the only change to, to Mill. Um, no changes to Compromise, which is kind of beyond me. Um, why Retribution got the axe and Mill is gets just this. Like, this is a good change. This is a big change. Don't get me wrong. But the fact that they, they absolutely axed Retribution and Honor and Loyalty and Compromise is fine to continue on in its current form, um, it kind of baffles me. Then we scroll down to First Responders. And I hate this change. First Responders is an absolutely cracked card, and when you come, when you're talking about cost on countermeasures, cost on countermeasures is more important than cost on any other card because countermeasures are things that you will often have to be forced to hold up multiple times. Now that's not true on First Responders because First Responders is one of the few countermeasures that will be guaranteed to trigger 100% of the time. Um, and First Responders, for those who might not remember, is at the end of your turn, add a 5th Brigade, which is the 1-5 guard, to your support line with plus 1, plus 1 for each enemy unit. Um, so what this means is, say you have 4 units on board by turn 4, which is not difficult, your opponent passes on turn 4, and then on the following turn, they will get a 5-9 guard on turn 4. They'll just get a Grenadier Guards on turn 4. And that's pretty powerful. Now, obviously, it requires floating four credits, so your opponent will be able to play around it, but they're not able to play around it by, like, getting rid of their own units. Like, if you just float four credits on an empty board, they might know First Responders is coming and not play more units on the board, but what are they going to do? And then you get it at the end of the enemy's turn, so then it can even attack or move. Excuse me, it can then attack or move on your turn, and it's a standard. This is a very, very powerful high-potency card, and reducing its cost from 4 to 3 is just absolutely nonsensical, uh, in my opinion. I think this is a card that 1939 has drastically over, um, or underestimated the power of. I think they looked at how little it was seen play and thought, well, it must be a bad card then. Well, the reason it didn't see a ton of play is just because people were doing other things. Like, the fact that they reduced it to 3 but didn't change its effect in any other way um, is kind of insane to me. Um, yeah, I I wish, or, like, they could have changed it to, like, three credits, um, you know, when the opponent uh, attacks the HQ, summon a fifth brigade in the support line with plus one, plus one for each enemy unit that dies at the end of your next turn, or something like that. Um, like, they, they could have done something like that. Um, obviously, that would be quite similar to Decisive Defense. Um, but, yeah, just... 
getting the Grenadier Guards on turn 4 is really, really dumb. Um, I do not like this change at all. Then we get to the 92nd Naval Brigade. Uh, I was actually playing some of this on stream yesterday. Uh, you should check me out on Twitch. Follow me if you haven't. I stream from time to time. Um, I also think this is a terrible change. I think this is, again, 1939 drastically overestimate, or underestimating the strength of a card based on its current play rate in the current meta. Um, 92nd Naval Brigade is a, a very, very powerful card. If they wanted to buff it, maybe change its reveal effect from lose two credits to the start of at the start of your next turn, or from three credits at the start of your next turn to lose two credits at the start of your next turn. Don't buff its health. This card is so difficult to get rid of. Ambush is an incredibly powerful effect. A three cost five four ambush is incredibly powerful. A three cost five four ambush that can't be hit by orders until the opponent attacks into it is insane. And yes, you pay an additional three credits for it later, but that is fine because you're eating a massive tempo swing. Like, your, your opponent is just absolutely dumpstering their tempo to try to get rid of this, and now it's even more difficult. Like, this is just further making, uh, playing against Covert, just like rolling the dice on like, well, I have to attack it if it's anything other than 92nd Naval Brigade, but if it is 92nd Naval Brigade, I have to be able to kill it, or else the ambush will get reset at the start of the turn. And, yeah, it, it's... And, like, you lose the unit that's going to attack into it, because who has a six attack or health unit that early in the game? Yeah, I, I strongly dislike this change. Um, there was weaker Covert units if you wanted to buff Covert in general. If you wanted to buff specifically this card, again, you could have changed um, the cost, the, the credits that you lose at the start of your next turn. Um, then we have a change to Workers Unite. This one is absolutely hilarious to me. Um, so Workers Unite was a card that was previously reworked, and the reworked version was five credits, discard all the light infantry units in your hand, and gain a credit and draw a card for each one. Um, and it saw zero play. Like, absolutely zero. I didn't even see anyone try it out. Like, everyone was just like, yeah, this card's terrible. Um, and now, it's gone down to two credits. Like, it went from 5 to 2. What have you ever seen in any other card game ever? Such a massive change in cost on a card that otherwise stays exactly the same. This is hilarious to me. And at 2 credits, this card's kind of insane. Um, like, low-key, this card is kind of goaded. Um... Specifically, like, even just, like, as, like, a credit generation format, um, maybe you could even, like, do Workers Unite and Reserves in, like, non-token decks as just, like, credit generation and, like, massive cycle. I don't know if maybe that's going a bit too far. Um, and again, I'm not just gonna, I'm not saying, like, tokens is gonna be, like, good in, on ladder, because tokens obviously ate a ton of, um, nerfs in the balance patch and rotation, uh, at the start of this, like, expansion cycle. But yeah, Workers Unite, absolutely um, crazy card right now. I'm, I'm interested in testing this out. Um, it's a very ambitious change. Maybe it should have gone to three at two. Maybe. Maybe it's he's played. Like, maybe maybe it's too good at uh, two. And maybe it enables some very silly things either now or in the future. But maybe it's not. Maybe at two, it's just good enough. And, you know, they're taking a lot of risk here. Um, then we have Shock Attack, going from 3 credits to 2 credits, so Shock Attack is sort of like the core card um, for the Smokescreen archetype, and we was previously saw um, Japan getting the Smokescreen uh, archetype card being added in with like through the reserves. Um, so yeah, this makes sense. They were trying to push uh, Smokescreen as an archetype. Um, we'll have to see how well that actually works. Um, the fun thing about Shock Attack, for those who don't remember, or weren't around at the time it happened, is Shock Attack was announced at one credit. It used to be a one credit card. Um, and then, at the time, like, the number one deck in the game was German Japan Heinz, that would just play exclusively smokescreen units in the support line until a pop-off turn. And everyone was just like, why on earth would you give the best deck in the game, like, an immediate auto-include card that directly helps their deck and basically nothing else? And the outrage was so high that by 239 nerfed it from 1 credit to 3 credits before the card even came out. <laughs> and then at 3 credits, it's absolutely no play. Um, and now it is going down to 2 credits, which is a nice balance ground. Um, you're still able to do some pretty wacky things with this card, like, particularly with, say, the Soviet AA guns. Um... 
or like Germany with the Panzer A's and the Stag 4's, um, you can get a lot of stats buffs to very cheap, particularly if you can combine it with an operation cost reduction. Um, so you can attack or move with all of these units on the same turn, um, which, you know, may, looking at Breakthrough, maybe we'll see some sort of German-Japan smokescreen deck, um, but maybe we'll see German-Soviet, Japan-Soviet, um, or maybe maybe smokescreen will just continue to be a bad deck, but certainly people are going to try it with uh, two-cost shock attack. Then we have Empire of the Sun, which is going from 10 credits back to 9 credits. Um, and if you watch my video about uh, the first, the history of the first ever OCC, uh, you will remember that Empire of the Sun used to be 9 credits, and it was so powerful that they had to nerf it to 10 credits, and it continued to see play for a little bit, and then it got power crept uh, out the wazoo. Um, so going back to 9 credits, I'm I'm content with this. Uh, this is happy. I think I think it might be still probably too weak to see play, but at least it's certainly more likely to see play. Um, I mean, just getting to 9 credits with Japan is difficult. <laughs> um, but yeah, it will, um, it will be interesting to see, um, if Empire of the Sand is able to have any impact. And then we get to RMT, uh, and this is a very fun one. So RMT is a card that, uh, actually saw play in 1OCC. I brought RMT. Um, in to an OCC and lost pretty terribly. Would not recommend it. But RMT was previously um, a seven cost, two operation, three nine guard. At the start of your turn, each French unit you can each non French unit you control gets plus one plus one. So it's sort of like a big Rima almost in a lot of ways. Um, and the difficulty with this card was just what French deck are you playing that you're getting to turn seven with lots of non French card like, non-French units on the board. Because, like, the only f French decks were, like, Resistance, which ran no units, or Mill, which ran no units, or, like, U.S. Frontline, which didn't get to turn 7. Like, Soviet France was the only possibility, and I tried it in Soviet France personally. It's just weaker than playing, like, the good 7-8 cost Soviet elites. RMT now is going to be competing directly with Rima, because RMT now is 5 cost, 3 operation, 2, 7, so it's receiving a minus 1, minus 2, but for the minus 2 cost. So this is huge. This can snowball out of control really, really quickly, but at 2 attack, um, it is a bit weaker than Rima in a lot of ways. 3 operation cost makes this card completely useless on its own. Um, it's obviously very vulnerable to being just suppressed, and then you have a 3 op 2, 7, um, which is terrible. But, unlike Rima, it buffs everything regardless of where they are, um, and it's not through the form of mobilization. Um, so, you know, the cards can take damage, they can be traded out, and they'll maintain it as long as this survives. And at 2-7, this is harder to remove um, for most decks than at a 4-6, so it doesn't die to hammer. Um, and, yeah, just generally 2-7, um, quite difficult to get rid of, but it does die to Raiding Brigade, that's sort of the trade-off. And then we have Stubborn Defense. I think this is the last card um, that is being buffed here, and Stubborn Defense used to be when an enemy unit attacks your unit, give your unit plus two defense. I loved this card. I don't know if I ever made a video about this card, but I absolutely love Stubborn Defense. It's one of my favorite cards in the game. Um, it's one downside is it's Polish. Um, and to be honest, that's kind of the only downside. You could even make, like, tier two versions of, um, Jagro or Frontline using Stubborn Defense, and it would be tier 2 for ladder because it, the surprise effect in a tournament, it would obviously drop off quite a bit because people are going to play around it. But that's the great thing about Starboard Defense is they have to play around it 100% of the time um, because it's zero cost. They can never know when you're holding it up. Um, so it, it stops a lot of trades. It forces a lot of trades to go very weird or people just choose not to play around it and sometimes get absolutely blown out by the card. The new version of Stubborn Defense is when an enemy attacks your unit, give your unit plus one defense, draw a card if the unit survives. So, in terms of just, like, immediate early game snowballing, it's less good. It's easier for your opponent to kill the unit through Stubborn Defense. A and if they do, Stubborn Defense is just a strictly nerfed version. However, if the unit survives, the drawing a card is massive in making this card not suck. Because most nations use their ally slot for card draw. Um, like, they'll just pack the ally nation full of card draw and then run the, the best cards from uh, each main nation. So, by 
having to run Polish ally, uh, you're already sacrificing a lot of that potential card draw, particularly in the type of aggressive mid-range decks that this card is going to be played in. Um, and those types of decks are going to be typically German ally for cards like Jaeger Regiment and 22nd. Um, so Stubborn Defense now actually drawing a card is a huge buff to that. However, it's also going to become much more difficult to play because you have to be worried about your opponent, you know, blitzing out a unit with higher attack than you were expecting to then be able to one-shot one of your units through Stubborn Defense. Um, so it's going to change a lot on how you play the card, it's going to change a lot on how the opponent plays the card, but it might be better, it might be worse, but people are going to try it, and it's going to be a card that has more impact on the game overall, I think, moving forward. And if we scroll down here, yep, this is the last card. Um, so these cards are all coming out on September 19th, along with a lot of bug fixes, UX adjustments, and uh, they don't mention it here, but this patch will also be coming out with a new game mode, a like tournament game mode. They haven't really said much about it, um, but it seems to be like an impromptu in-client tournament. Um, and I'm very excited to learn more about that whenever they um, announce more about that. And of course, you can expect a video with my thoughts and explanation on that change when it is announced. But that, for now, is everything I have to say about the balance changes, as well as the cards coming back from Reserve. Uh, let me know if you agree with me, you disagree with me, um, you think I missed something. Let, let me know all of that in the comments down below, or in my Discord. Link to the Discord is in the description. Um, as well as in the description, you will find a link to my Twitch, where I sometimes stream, so you should follow me there if you haven't, free of cost. Um, or... If you would like to support me and you have the means to support me, um, you can feel free to donate at the link in the description as well. And thank you very much to everybody who has donated. It honestly does help out a ton. And uh, that will be it from me for this one. I will catch all of y'all in the next video, which might be the Japanese uh, Elite's tier list. We will see. No promises, but it might be something else. But uh, yeah, you can expect that coming soon.